Hello everyone, good morning and welcome to today's session of the NPTEL course Indian Fiction in English. This week we begin looking at the idea of caste as represented in Indian English fiction. There could also be certain instances where caste is entirely absent. So we are looking at these two ambivalent instances of the different ways in which caste is represented and also looking at those absences and gaps where caste gets represented either in a minimal fashion or in a certain way that would uh, render its depiction extremely problematic. In this week's uh, uh, sessions we will be looking at two novels primarily, one, uh, one being Untouchable by uh, Mulkraj Anand and the other one The God of Small Things, the Booker winning novel by Arudhari Roy. So the objective of today's lecture is to set the context, to set the stage for those discussions on those two novels which are said to be predominantly about caste. There are a number of reviews, a number of critical works locating those two works within the moorings of uh, Indian caste system. But at the same time there are certain lapses, there are certain limitations and challenges within which those works are fraught as well. So this lecture needs to be seen in that context trying to open up certain avenues for uh, discussion in terms of the relationship of caste with Indian uh, English fiction and uh, vice versa. For this uh, purpose, this lecture is loosely based on uh, Tabish Kher's work Babu Fictions, Alienation in Contemporary Indian English uh, Novels. It is a work published in 2005 where he also has an entire chapter titled Caste the Hiranyagarbha Syndrome. He talks about the presence of caste and its relative absence and tries to uh, place it in the socio historical context of uh, contemporary India. He also tries to theorize it though minimally. A familiarity with uh, Kher's chapter uh, caste the Hiranyagarbha syndrome it would be uh, highly useful uh, as in when you try to follow this lecture. This uh, work Babu Fictions, it has a very interesting dedication at the beginning of uh, this uh, uh, book um, Kher has written. This book is dedicated to family servants, village relatives and those friends of the first 24 years of my life who could not read Indian English fiction but whom Indian English fiction often claims to have read. If you look at some of the novels that we have already engaged with, we have already understood that Indian English fiction claims to read and narrate the nation and its many inhabitants. It is a body of writing which claims to completely understand and to completely represent what India is about and we have seen it in multiple ways in uh, different novels. But here Kher is talking about a certain kind of an irony which is present here and this irony gets all the more heightened. It is possible to accentuate the nature of that irony especially when one begins to talk about certain problematic areas such as caste or gender and quite rightfully as in when he has situated the context of this work, Kher identifies three major areas of tension as far as the narrative world of uh, Indian English fiction is concerned. He talks about caste, class and gender in that context. He goes on to argue that being problematic areas being problematic uh, concepts, there is an absence, there is an apathy and sometimes there is a certain kind of a redundance with which these themes are, these uh, ideas are treated. And he goes on to examine in detail the treatment of caste especially in Indian English fiction and that is the objective of this entire chapter titled caste the Hiranyagarbha syndrome. He makes this much talked about and uh, mostly visible connection between caste and English language to be specific upper casteness and English language and he talks about how for reasons of inhabiting privileged circumstances, privileged habitats, the Indian English authors they are also able to distance them away from certain realities such as caste which is mostly uh, relegated as an unmodern thing which is mostly seen as a backward thing that the modern secular 
citizen would rather not associate with. Uh, Kesh makes this statement somewhere in the beginning of this uh, uh, chapter itself. Here if English education of a cosmopolitan proficiency is seen as a culturally empowering and economically incashable factor. Notice how language is being seen as culturally empowering and economically incashable. The group of English speaking and writing Babus, the reference is obviously to the authors, the Indian English authors, can be almost solely located within the upper caste and classes, forming a sort of intellectual and cultural cream in secular fields. This obvious connection that care begins to draw between English language and the ones who inhabit those worlds empowered by English language, it is not a novel idea. Many sociologists have spoken about it. There are a lot of historical and uh, sociological uh, concurrence and evidence to this uh, kind of an observation or an idea that uh, care is projecting. But to be able to see this in the context of Indian English fiction, that is perhaps the originality that Kerr brings in to this uh, strand of argument. Here he is referring to the cosmopolitan habitats that are familiarized, are frequented by the Indian English authors and he also equates this cosmopolitan proficiency with upper caste and upper classes. Herein lies the problem to begin with. Herein lies the ambivalence that care is perhaps trying to engage with. And herein also lies the superficial understanding of caste which care at some level is trying to uncover, is forcing us to rather uncover. With a few introductory statements on the status of caste, and having explained how caste could be understood in the modern context and how jati is different from the modern understanding of caste and having provided a certain sociological sense of how caste operates in modern India, Kerr begins to talk about the overwhelming concentration of the Indian English gaze on the middle and upper classes. And he gives the example of a novel like Antapura published in 1938, which we have also noticed was celebrated as a novel which presented a microcosmic vision, a microcosmic idea of the nation. And there we also found that the author Raja Rao, he claims to have a, a very authentic insider's kind of an information, an insider's kind of an outlook on the depiction of an Indian village, a typical Indian village, which is entirely um, fascinated, which is entirely in awe at the new emergent nationalist politics under the leadership of Gandhi. We find the character Murthy and a number of other characters who are being presented from the perspective of an upper caste narrator who is present within the novel and the novel itself is authored by an upper caste author. And having stated these things, Kerr goes on to make this argument and claim that even the other novels which are based in Indian villages, they have this tendency to look at and represent the rural middle class and upper caste and that is seen as the presentation of the rural middle class and the upper caste within the context of an Indian village is then presented as being pan-Indian. So the problem inherently lies not in talking about the upper caste presence, not in telling the stories of uh, the middle class or upper caste individuals who are uh, characters in the novels, but the problem lies, the problem begins when you begin to present these limited narratives as being pan-Indian. And there is also a tendency then to assume that perhaps there is a pan-Indian caste in village, a pan-Indian caste in the urban areas where it is minimalized, where it is uh, 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 presented in a minimal way to such an extent that it becomes impossible to see through the many complexities within which caste operates. Care also alerts us to certain different kinds of depictions which are also rare exceptions in the context of Indian English fiction 
uh, care talks about the novel untouchable by Anand which we shall be looking at in detail this week. There is a lower caste character Baka, but the character of Baka is also described from an upper caste perspective. There is a problem inherent in that which we shall be looking at in detail shortly. And there is also Raja Rao's character Jamni from his uh, short story The Cow of the Barricades. There is a presence. If you ask someone whether the lower caste characters have been presented, yes, there is a presence. But in what ways are they presented? Therein lies the challenge and the limitation and the problematic. In uh, Kher's own words, it is not that the caste other is completely ignored, but that his or her presence in most cases has been subsumed rewritten and marginalized. One would like to argue otherwise presenting different case studies from different contexts of Indian uh, fiction. But Kerr maintains through a series of discussions which you would also figure out if you read through the essay, there are many examples that he gives from Indian English fiction written from the 1930s onwards to showcase that there is a way in which a pan-Indian cast has gets talked about but there are no actual references, there are no indicators of the way in which caste operates in a very complex and ambiguous manner. And this reference, this depiction is either of the middle class and the upper caste which is seen as pan-Indian or there is a way in which the lower caste character also gets incorporated into the narrative fold but through a definitely an upper caste uh, perspective. And there are uh, certain instances where Kerr talks about, he refers to the presence of a lower caste character where the character is used mostly as a device to reinforce, uh, reinforce a shaken uh, status quo. The example that he gives is uh, from the novel The Cradle of the Clouds published in 1951 where a character, a low caste Hindu is used to represent tradition, to reinforce tradition and uh, he is along with two other characters, one a Brahmin and other a Christian. So, Kerr is trying to ask perhaps whether the lower caste characters are used conveniently here, whether the presence of the lower caste characters are manipulated or maneuvered in such a way that it also serves the same end, especially in Cradle of the Clouds as uh, we can see the three characters, Brahmin, Kristen and the uh, low caste character, they are not essentially different because they together the, the objective within the narrative for these three seemingly different characters are only to reinforce tradition, only to talk about, uh, only to glorify the important aspects of tradition. And there is another uh, interesting aspect that Kerr talks about where he identifies that the impetus to emancipation almost always comes from the upper caste character. He gives the example of Murti in Kantabra which he also talks about in detail. If you recall the narrative structure of the novel Kantapura, you would also remember that Murti becomes extremely important in that village Kantapura. He ceases to be just another villager. He becomes almost like uh, a mini Gandhi. He becomes uh, an extension of the, the, the political figure of Gandhi and Murti gets elevated to this status in spite of the regional, local uh, situations within which he is placed. He becomes someone who is capable of leading the entire villages irrespective of the caste class differences. There is a subsuming of all kinds of differences, class, caste and uh, ca class, caste and religion which happens over there which we also notice in the depiction of uh, a, a villainous character, Bade Khan, the only Muslim character in Kantapura who is also presented as a villain. And there is a clear difference in the narration between us and them, the narrator, uh, the, uh, the female narrator being someone who belongs obviously to the upper caste. So the us and them dichotomy which is built in or uh, perhaps inadvertently and this uh, responsible uh, protagonist who also incidentally again belongs to an upper caste character, they all seem to tell us that there is a way in which a normalcy gets, gets restored. There is a way in which a certain kind of normalcy is ascribed to the presence of an upper caste character as a protagonist as the leader, as the main storyteller, as the uh, 
one who gives perspective. While the presence of uh, uh, their uh, caste names or the, the references to caste rituals become incidental, they never refer to anything as being even remotely casteist. That is something uh, very interesting that perhaps we can continue to observe in most discussions about caste in the contemporary, especially when they are represented in uh, different kinds of art forms. Drawing from these examples from contemporary Indian English fiction, Kerr is trying to drive home the idea that there is a problematic lack of independent lower caste characters within the fold of Indian fiction. He tries to engage with the many reasons for this and he ends up identifying certain factors of class positioning, cultural heritage, urbanization and the geographical location of the Indian English authors which surprisingly are rather similar. He reminds us that most Indian English writers are far remote from spheres of active caste based prejudices let alone caste conflicts which contemporary India is also ridden with and uh, he refers to most contemporary Indian English authors as being based abroad or in cities like Delhi, Calcutta, Madras, Bombay and Bangalore and there is also ample evidence to uh, show that care is not entirely wrong. It would be rather naive to say that it is a concerted effect, it is a concerted effort of all of these writers to deliberately ignore caste, to deliberately stay away from spheres of active uh, caste ridden uh, areas. It just so happens that again incidentally it just so happens that all almost all Indian English writers they seem to be inhabiting a certain kind of class privilege, they seem to be uh, inheriting certain cultural heritages and they also seem to be part of a, a growing urban cosmopolitan set of authors who are entirely removed from the realities which are part of uh, caste based conflicts, class based conflicts or any region based uh, differences. And care in certain ways is also trying to reason out this lack of lower caste characters by trying to tell us that maybe this is the kind of reality, this is the kind of social circumstances, the social circles that these authors are used to and this becomes a realistic kind of portrayal for them and a kind of caste based society where there are differences based on caste, where there are conflicts based on caste differences those things become relegated to a past. It is a past that modern India would rather not associate with. The secular Indian citizen would rather uh, distance himself or herself from. And in these limited attempts, in this challenging situation, Kerr also identifies certain brave attempts. He calls them brave but he also has certain reservations about them. He makes a reference to the younger writers who have moved away from what he calls a Rao like knowledge of caste. He finds Rao's uh, position in terms of uh, his uh, depiction of caste, his depiction of Kantapura as an ideal village society. He finds those depictions problematic but nevertheless care is very careful and uh, rather prompt to acknowledge that Rao was knowledgeable about the intricate hierarchies within which caste operated. And this he says, this knowledge is not available to the younger writers for whatsoever reasons, maybe it is not part of their immediate reality or it is not there at all in the urban um, cosmopolitan circles within which they operate. And referring to these brave attempts, there are two works that um, Kerr makes a particular mention of. Rohinton Mystery's novel A Fine Balance and Arun Thudi Roy's novel The God of Small Things. Both have used lower characters, lower caste characters. In Arun Thudi Roy's novel we have Veluta who is almost as significant as a protagonist and in uh, A Fine Balance which is a series of stories strung together and uh, in, the, with, in the backdrop of uh, the event of emergency we have two important Dalit characters occupying the center stage almost throughout the novel. But this depiction of uh, the lower caste characters, the use of lower caste characters in these brave attempts, Kerr says are not without lapses. He uh, 
courts an earlier work on mystery to argue that there's an almost there is there is almost an anxiety on mystery's part and he gives the specific example of the way in which dina the female uh, character who also belongs to a parsi family he gives this example of how dina stories are narrated and how ishwar's and om prakash stories are uh, narrated ishwar and om prakash are the dalit characters here there is a classic kind of realism which we can see when dina's past is portrayed it's a very classic realist portrayal but the moment we enter the stories of ishwar and om prakash either in the past or from the way they are narrating it from the present we find the elements of the fantastic the fairy tale the newspaper reportage and all these seemingly unreliable things coming in because there's no other way in which the stories of ishwar and om prakash could be narrated the realist mode that he adopts while narrating the story of dina cannot be used in the context of ishwar and om prakash because their worlds are entirely different you also need certain different genres and certain different kinds of elements coming in to complete the story to make the story more palatable more believable yeah. so this is what care tries to uh point out when he's talking about the lapses in these presentations of lower caste characters and there is also certain dangers in moving to the other end of the spectrum where just like uh, anand's untouchable there is a tendency to present the lower caste characters as being godlike as being the perfect image of uh, godlike subalterns we find a similar kind of a treatment maybe not to the extent of uh, not to the extent to as we see in untouchable we find a similar kind of a treatment being employed in the god of small things too where veluta is presented as a different kind of a subaltern as a different kind of a paravan yeah that's a kind of uh, the word that the novel uses um we we uh, shall perhaps take a look at these things in detail when we talk about the novel the god of small things while care is attentive to the many lapses in the depiction of the lower caste characters or in the approach of these younger writers uh, in in the context of caste he also acknowledges that they are more open to the idea of certain kinds of socio cultural change than perhaps the rao anand narayan generation was so the younger post rushdi writers they try to deliberately embrace this idea of change by depicting a different social setting altogether but kher says that there is still a problem inherent in that because in most cases again not all in most cases this openness to the idea of change this acknowledgement that the world order has entirely changed the claim that it's more or less a casteless society and it is no longer possible to have a caste ridden society mostly works as an extension of as a legitimation of their own cosmopolitan class positioning kher argues it out brilliantly in his uh, chapter which i again encourage you to uh, read through closely and he furthers his argument to show that the absence of the complexities of caste either in the narrative structure or in the lived reality that these indian english uh, authors see around them the social circles that they move around this absence is not proof of the irrelevance of caste should not be taken as proof of the irrelevance of caste because caste continues to operate in invisible and in invisible ways perhaps outside this fold maybe there is a fold of indian english writers or any such kind of privileged uh, coterie where they can afford to be immune to certain social realities this is not this is applicable not just in the case of caste it could be true in the case of gender in the case of religion in the case of many things that we talk about in in, in a society and um we may also recall spivak's observation that we have not yet seen an into anglian fiction writer of tribal origin yeah could this be an incidental fact too notwithstanding the fact that there are many writers emerging from the uh, northeast who also face different kinds of uh, uh, challenges in terms of being marginalized and being pitched against the post rushdi writers of the mainland yeah we will talk about it in a uh, 
in one of the following weeks where we focus on the writers from the northeast and this inability to engage with the historical and dialectical development of caste is something that concerns care to the core because he argues that if one is not attentive to the complexities in terms of history in terms of dialectics one will not be able to engage with caste in a proper way to quote care by leaving unaddressed the complex historical and dialectical development of the structures of caste based exploitation one fails to provide a plan of action to tackle it in the present because whenever in most cases whenever caste gets talked about in the context of indian english fiction it is either incidental or to show that it is possible to surpass the limitations of caste that caste has ceased to be important it is an irrelevant uh, concept in the, in the modern context but this kind of an invisibility this kind of an irrelevance attributed to caste will be extremely delimiting in the long run because as care points out if one does not acknowledge the basic structures from which caste based exploitation emerges they would it would not be possible to come up with a plan of action to engage with it to respond with it to even to attempt to solve it and this could be seen an extension of this could be seen in multiple ways in the arena of indian english fiction um care gives us a couple of more examples uh, one being the use of myth in the narratives of indian english fiction he draws from meenakshi mukherjee's observation that indian english authors prefer uh, mostly myths drawn from the ramayana and not from the mahabharata mukherjee also reasons in, uh, reasons this out in a very interesting way because uh, she argues that the indian mind finds it easier to accept the ideal characters of the ramayana rather than the ambiguous complicated characters of the mahabharata and he she she also furthers this argument which care also uh, uses to further his own claim and his own argument that the ramayana vis-a-vis the mahabharata is seen as a wellspring of upper caste largely brahminical value system in india and for the same reason care extends this argument to wonder whether the use of myth being limited to the ramayana is also an indirect way in which indian english fiction tries to limit itself to this largely upper caste value system and in terms of gender and sexuality also we find this difference being uh, showcased in rather alarming ways uh, we have noted how unattentive or perhaps how irresponsible the field of indian english fiction is towards the many depictions of gender how stereotypical certain observations are and how the post rashti generation has almost managed to gloss over the area of women's writing in ways that we looked at briefly in one of the earlier sessions care refers to one of the best selling novels of the post rashti period upamanyu chatterjee's english august there there is an instance of a violation of a tribal woman by a babu babu is the protagonist the uh, lead protagonist who is also an ias officer who is posted in the rural hinterlands of uh, uh, northern india and he feels rather trapped there because he is a modern cosmopolitan fun loving young man who realizes that there's nothing that he shares in common with the rural india and this violation which emerges as only an incidental uh, episode in uh, the course of the novel english august in fact i also remember one of the reviews talking about this episode as the as a way in which august the protagonist merely responds to a tribal woman it's not even an important sequence that the novel or any of its discussions uh, 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 refer to so here the violation of this tribal woman by the protagonist august is present in terms of uh, babu's different sexual norms yeah ba- babu is the term that uh, care repeatedly almost throughout this work he uses to 
refer to the privileged status that the Indian English author or any other privileged citizen enjoys. So, in English August, this violation is presented in terms of the privileged citizen, Babu's different sexual norms and of the Babu's sexual starvation in a sexually frigid zone. Beyond that, it does not have any significance because a tribal woman's sexuality or the violation of it can be glossed over as an incidental episode. It need not be outrageous. It need not receive much of her attention. Yeah? Just like the Dalit man's death or the Dalit man's marginalization is, can be glossed over in say a narrative like uh, uh, the God of Small Things where inevitably irrespective of the uh, radicalism that it presents towards the end it, it ends with the death of the Dal Dalit man. So, just like it becomes an incidental occurrence here we find that the trampling upon of the sexuality of the tribal woman also occurs as an incidental episode. Kerr wraps up this discussion by referring to the urban landscapes in Indian English fiction. We would perhaps have the time later on to look at how invariably most Indian English novels are located in these cosmopolitan uh, cities of India. How there is a pan Indianness to these cosmopolitan cities and how it also becomes a certain kind of a norm to talk about the narratives of uh, India. And he asked this, Kerr asked this uh, very uh, pertinent question, what is the character of the Indian English town or city? We find that there is a certain uniform kind of a landscape that we can find in Indian English fiction because most urban landscapes are organized less in terms of caste and more in terms of class. And it is much easier to gloss over caste and completely subsume and minimize the effect of the after effect of caste in an urban class based society. And he also makes this important point to showcase that the urbanness in Indian English fiction, the depiction of the urban landscape in Indian, in, in, in Indian English fiction is also a trope, a ploy, deliberate or inadvertent to totally override, totally overwrite the effects of caste because the kind of class which Indian English fiction talks about is a class system that is often, he clarifies not always, superimposed on older lines of caste divisions. You just name it differently. So, caste becomes merely an incidental occurrence over there with class somehow occupying a more important position and there is a way in which one can always equate class with various other factors like the economic aspect, the cultural uh, heritage. It could be something that you acquire through education, through the kind of exposure that you get. There are multiple ways in which caste can be uh, camouflaged, ca caste can be made completely invisible when you use certain markers of class. And this is what perhaps Indian English fiction had been perhaps inadvertently doing. This is a kind of argument, this is the line of argument that Kerr tries to pursue throughout this chapter. And in the context of this discussion, I encourage you to take a look at Untouchable and the God of Small Things in detail to see how there is a glossing over of caste even when the novels are really about caste you would see that both these novels have adopted different pathways to talk about caste. In Untouchable, it is a very Gandhian way of looking at caste and in uh, The God of Small Things, we find a more a refined lower caste protagonist, someone who is conscious of his rights, a politically aware Dalit emerges as the protagonist in the form of Veluta. It is of course, a very radical way of uh, presenting a uh, caste what Arudhati Roy has adopted. But nevertheless, there are certain inescapable inroads within which we find the depiction of caste continues to be fraught in the context of Indian English fiction. As I wrap up this lecture, I also leave you with this repeated appeal to read the novels Untouchable and The God of Small Things so that you would be able to make better sense of the discussions which are 
uh, which are to follow in the uh, following sessions uh, this week. I thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.